The lady I'm very carefully trying not to infect with anything has an aggressive form of bone marrow cancer. Her doctors have put her in sterile isolation following a massive dose of chemo, which has left her immune system practically non-existent. That chart up there, they'll yeah. start writing down my red and white blood cells, my platelets, and they'll keep track of it every day. Today is zero, and then tomorrow will be, you know, plus one. Okay. To replenish her white blood cell count, Anne's about to receive a routine stem cell transplant. But to get her gut back in working order, she'll have to undergo a slightly less routine procedure. The chemotherapy like wipes out everything, and not only does it wipe out your blood cells, but everything in your GI tract. All this natural flora that's growing there that protects you and has things moving along is all wiped out as well. When did you submit your stool sample? A couple of weeks ago. It's not fun, right? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Especially, you know, because I took the train in from Long Island, so yeah. I have my bag of poop. There's just enough room for me to squeeze in and get my bag of poop, like, right up in everybody's faces. <laughs> <laughs> so you're banking your own bacteria. And then once I have the red blood cells and white blood cells building back up again, then they would, like, re-inject them into me with, like, an enema. Okay, yeah. Dr. Ying Tower and his team have found that a fecal transplant can increase the odds of survival by restoring the diversity of gut bacteria lost during chemo. Is there a direct relationship between diversity of flora in the gut and immune health? In terms of the microbiome, if you look at a transplant patient's diversity during their treatment, if you had a low diversity, then you were over five times more likely to die of transplant-related causes compared to if you had a nice diversity of healthy, health-promoting bacteria in your gut. There's this amazing set of creatures living in all of us, working 24-7 for mutual benefit. And we're seeing links everywhere. We're seeing links to prevention of infection, to allergies, autoimmune disorders, mood, autism, depression. All these creatures working inside us are what scientists refer to as the human microbiome. No, this has opened a whole new dimension in medicine. You know, it's not science fiction anymore, as you can see. It's on, on the front lines. I don't, I don't recall any fecal transplants in the science fiction I <laughs> read or saw. <laughs> Since the 19th century, germ theory has been the dominant model of medical thinking. It holds that microorganisms like bacteria and viruses are responsible for infecting our bodies and causing disease. Therefore, the best way to avoid disease is to cleanse our body and its surroundings of germs. Unfortunately, this antibacterial dragnet has not only helped eliminate dangerous pathogens from our environment, it's also knocked out the good microorganisms that live in us and are responsible for healthy digestion, immune reaction, and as researchers are learning, an ever-widening number of vital roles. We've done an awful lot of work looking at how the built environment that we've constructed around ourselves affects how our microbes are developing in our microbiome. Dr. Jack Gilbert is the head of microbiome research at Argonne National Labs. He's found that living in areas with high microbial diversity significantly reduces the occurrence of asthma and other diseases. We've got places like um, Amish communities here in America, whereby the children are exposed to animals and uh, dust and dirt environments that their ancestors were exposed to on a regular basis. And those children have very low levels of asthma, very low levels, levels of atopy, so, you know, allergic disease, even lower levels of autism. If we go to the developing world, those children have many, many, many more microbial exposures. But there's a cost-benefit analysis there, but they also have much higher levels of infant mortality because their access to medical uh, prevention for diseases and other complications is much more limited. Would the best of both worlds be to, you know, grow up somewhere with the medicine available to you to, you know, not die when you're six, obviously, but um, nevertheless be like, exposed to much more bacteria than we are, or much more microorganisms? Absolutely. I mean, we've shifted too far away from the environments which supported our health, and now we need to move backwards a little bit. This is why it's so important to go to Africa and study populations of people which we wouldn't normally have access to in this community. So we did. We came to Africa. We're in the Central African Republic right now, a town called Bayanga, kind of just smack in the heart of Africa. We're following Dr. Andres Gomez, who is a microbiome researcher. When we talk about Westerners or industrialized microbiomes, we lack diversity. 
to learn what's missing from the industrialized microbiome. Researchers like Dr. Gomez have turned to the planet's few remaining pre-industrial societies to see what their guts have that our guts don't. Dr. Gomez hit fecal pay dirt while looking at the microbiome's mountain gorillas in Central Africa. He realized that the stool samples he was taking from them bore an uncanny resemblance to samples taken from the people living in the surrounding forest, called the Bayaka. I collected the samples, uh, sequenced their microbiomes, and that's where I discovered, well, this is something, this is something important here. The Bayaka are traditional hunter-gatherers who live in the Zangasanga Forest Preserve. Their lifestyle is not only pre-industrial, but pre-agricultural. The fact that the Bayaka's microbial diversity is closer to gorillas than industrialized people suggests that their environment and lifestyle have an enormous effect on their microbiomes. So we hiked for two hours into the jungle to see what both these things look like. This is it. So these are all their huts. Everybody is now mobilizing to go hunting. Telling the animals to come into his net. The Bayaka hunt by stringing up nets in a large circle, then flushing out animals from the encircled forest into set nets, which isn't always as cut and dry as it sounds. That's, I guess, the fourth animal that's gotten through a net. Yeah, today's really a gather day, for sure. Part of what Andreas is studying in terms of the microbiome, a good deal of it relates to what we'll be gathering, the foods that they eat, and also the bark from trees and stuff they use as medicines. But the environment itself has a uh, major impact on your microbiome. So if you can't climb a tree and collect honey, you're not man enough to have a wife. Wow. Oh, The shrimp? Yeah, pull it, keep pulling. Whoa. Whoa! I did not expect that to come out. That's food, right? The forest not only acts as the Bayaka's live-in grocery store, but also their pharmacy. The barks and leaves the Bayaka use as medicine may seem primitive to the average CVS shopper, but unlike modern antibiotics, which don't always discriminate between good and bad bacteria, they're a lot easier on the microbiome. Let me scrape this bark. Oh, you put your breast milk in it, and then you would use that and put it in your ear. This is a medicine for headaches. They so rub it up in your hands. Whoa! Oh, yeah. Burns a little bit. Yeah, it, it burns a lot. Well, well, headache gone. Yeah. Two foods that Dr. Gomez is particularly interested in due to their potential connection to the Bayaka's microbiome are cocoa leaves and forest yams, which have a much higher fiber content than their Western counterparts. This is the thing, if, if we have the right microbiome, right. like these people have been adapted to for millennia, those things are not gonna be detrimental for you. Like how a cow can eat grass, but we can. That a cow can eat grass, but we can, yeah. The cocoa leaves the Bayaka eat by the pile are likewise ill-suited to our industrialized guts. What role do these play in the uh, microbiome? Fermentation. Wouldn't be surprised if the bloom of specific bacterial groups is in response to this specific cocoa leaf. The Bayaka's fiber-rich diet doesn't just make taking stool samples a lot easier. The breakdown and fermentation of complex foods in their colon helps populate the lower reaches of the GI tract with a greater diversity of microbes. <laughs> Actually being able to see what the Bayaka eat and how they get it helps explain some of the findings in Dr. Gomez's research that lab science alone could not. This basic anthropological observation, combined with the fecal samples, helps paint a complete picture of the Bayaka's microbial health, which could in turn help us restore our own depleted modern guts to their original nature. With every advance comes a caveat, you know, a sacrifice. So we, we were able to extend our life spans, but at the same time, we have starved our microbiomes. And depletion of diversity is correlated to weakened immune systems. It's not something we've lost. Though. We've lost them, and the, the real question is, are we able to recover them back? I think future generations are going to be enjoying the fruits of the things that we're, we're doing right now with the microbiome.